I would request everyone to be seated. All mobile phones kept on to silent mode. And I now have the proud privilege in inviting on stage our distinguished moderator for this session, Dr. Vidya Yerabdekar, Chair Fiki Higher Education Committee and Pro Chancellor Symbiosis International University. Let's put our hands together to welcome Ma'am onto the stage. I also have the proud privilege in inviting our eminent panelists. I invite Srimati Neeta Prasad, Joint Secretary, PNICC, Department of Higher Education, Ministry of Education, Government of India. Warm welcome to you, ma'am. I invite Professor Anil Kashyap, President and Chancellor, NICMAR University, Pune. A very warm welcome to you, sir. I invite Dr. B. Chandrasekhar, Executive Director, Corporate Planning, at SIL. Very warm welcome to you, sir. I welcome Dr. Agnes Atim Apia, Member of Parliament, Uganda, and Social Entrepreneur. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am. I welcome Mr. Harsh Shah, CEO of Institute of Risk Management, India Affiliate. Very warm welcome, sir. And I also invite our eminent panelists, Mr. Sandeep Shah, General Manager in HOD, IFSC and Strategy at Gift City. Very warm welcome, sir. So ladies and gentlemen, the panel discussion three is on the topic of globalizing higher education, a perspective from the global south. And our distinguished moderator for this session, Dr. Vidya Yarabdekar, is the principal director of Symbiosis Society and pro-chancellor of Symbiosis International University. Symbiosis International University is a multidisciplinary, multinational, multicultural university having more than 45,000 students from all states of India and international students from 85 countries. The Symbiosis Society not only has under its ambit the Symbiosis International University, but also has K-12 schools, College of Arts and Commerce and Museums, the Afro-Asian Cultural Museum, and the Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Museum and Memorial. Dr. Vidya has been appointed as a member of the expert group on global outreach of higher education, formulated by UGC to implement the National Education Policy 2020 that was rolled out by the Ministry of Education, Government of India, member of the advisory group of analytical advisory work, ASA, World Bank Advisory Committee of the IAU for the Global Survey on Internationalization and member of the Board of Trustees of Muscat University, Oman. She is a chairperson of the FIKI Committee on Higher Education serving the third term. She is also the Vice President of Maharatta Chamber of Commerce, Industries and Agriculture, MCCIA. Dr. Vidya has been appointed as member of Indian Brand Equity Foundation, IBEF, trust set up by the Ministry of Commerce and Industries, can, Government uh, of India. Uh, thank you. Ma'am, this is still, I think I have That's okay. still cut you're off, not, uh, edited half me. of what ma'am has <laughs> so much accomplishments to her credit that I think That's I would right. need at least 10 minutes of the session to you so talk much. about you. Didn't you introduce any and other speaker. Huh? So ladies, uh, ma'am, that privilege we have left for you to do. So I had the honors of introducing the moderator. So ladies and gentlemen, with that, I hand over to Dr. Vidya. Though she has cut me short, not let me introduce her, but over to you, ma'am, to take carry forward. Is this working? Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, it's the last session of the day. And uh, I'm sure there are people who are in the audience are the ones who are really interested in internationalization. But I must say that we have a great panel. Uh, Madam Anita Prasadji, Joint Secretary from the Ministry of Education. I'm very happy that she could find time because she deals with international cooperation. And we're really interested in knowing uh, the direction in which uh, the Indian government and specifically Ministry of Education is working towards. And of course, an August panel that was already mentioned, so I won't take names of everybody, but we have someone from Uganda, so we're talking about Global South, and then uh, Mr. Shaha from the Risk Management Institute, and uh, the president of NICPA, uh, Dr. Kashyap, and of course, uh, Dr. Chandra Shekhar, who actually deals with student mobility uh, through EDSIL. Uh, so this is a very important topic, uh, and I think it has been discussed and deliberated in our country a couple of times. And very recently, 
uh, on the 17th of November, in fact, there was a, a summit on the Global South. And various aspects were discussed. Various ministries played an important role in the discussions and deliberations. And I was very happy to read in the newspapers about the Ministry of Education being a, a very important part in the discussions and deliberations with education ministers from the countries of the Global South participating. And our education minister and ministry played a real, uh, lead role. I'm sure uh, Ms., uh, Mrs. Neeta Prasad will certainly cover this. Uh, I, for one, believe that you know the the the, uh, the gravitational pull has really shifted from what was called as a global north to the global south. Uh, all of us uh, not just see collaborations with our universities with those in the north, which was earlier true. But now we also see a lot of collaborations happening between uh, universities in the global south. We uh, interact with South Africa as far as Latin America and of course on, on this side uh, even South Asia. And we were already there in, uh, you know, with Middle East, West Asia as we call them. And uh, there are several reasons uh, for this. We see that the number of institutions in the global north that were uh, earlier very high, uh, the 20,000 uh, higher education institutions in the global north, there was a peak in, in 2011, but then you saw a decline um, yeah, from uh, of higher education institutions from the global north. And you see uh, almost a rise, uh, you know, a double rise in uh, institutions in the Global South, you know, from 40,000 institutions, they rose to 70,000. And the world uh, statistics shows that there are 90,000 higher education institutions. So that's what you see. Uh, similarly, uh, student mobility, uh, I won't say student mobility, but student enrollment, which is over 200 million students are studying across the world, uh, the largest portion of young students study in the Global South. Again, there has been a huge rise of younger population in higher education institutions in the Global South. And therefore, you know, the Global South uh, has, uh, you know, got a distinct identity of itself. And uh, I would also say that countries in the Global South have started talking to each other uh, and telling the Global North, uh, you know, uh, that we are there. You cannot ignore us. Right? You can't just call us developing countries, emerging countries. We are the largest consumer base for whatever you do. So I think we have become very vocal. We have, I would say, to some extent, even aggressive. Uh, and I feel our country can play a major lead role uh, amongst the countries in the global south. Uh, and I'm so happy that the Honorable Prime Minister keeps mentioning about this, that how India can be a leader of the Global South in various areas. And even if we limit our discussions to higher education, I'm sure we can play a major role in, uh, in the Global South. Uh, certainly India can play, and Indian higher education institutions can play a major role. I sit on some of the international networks, and there is a network uh, called Obrial Global, uh, which was uh, actually born out of the University of Barcelona. And, uh, you know, they, they were just limited to discussions in Europe with European universities, but later expanded their base to, uh, you know, to India, to South Africa. And then they realized that there is so much in the global south so that they can be connected with. And now you see that the connections have grown stronger between South Africa, India, and South America. And when we have discussions, you realize that we are all the same, our problems are the same, our challenges are the same. And of course, you know, um, uh, you know the student aspirations are also the same. Uh, however, because of the distances, probably you don't see as many Latin American students studying in India or Indian students studying in Latin America. But we need to create these dialogues. And I think this forum is actually for that. How can we create dialogues uh, in the Global South? Uh, how can Global South have an emergence, uh, have, you know, uh, be, uh, be known, um, you know, and because it has such a huge young population, uh, we cannot be ignored. And how can India play a major role uh, as a leader in higher education institution? Even if you look at the demographic dividend, as, all, as we call the median age in India is 28, whereas it's, in Africa it's about 18.8. Uh, and China is 39. And when someone just mentioned, I think uh, the chief guest this morning, uh, Mr. BVR Subramaniam, did make a mention of this that you know by 2047, uh, our median age will grow, and then Africa will be the youngest uh, you know uh, region in the world. And here is a lady who represents uh, the parliament in Uganda, 
and I'm sure she'll cover it, and uh, young aspirational Africans uh, who also seek uh, Indian higher education. We see them all over in Indian higher education institutions. So there's so much that we can do, we can influence in the Global South, and I think uh, this is just one of the best topics that has been selected and carved out for these uh, two days of uh, academic discussions and deliberations. So I'll stop here. Uh, what I would suggest that uh, you know we start off from, of course, the Joint Secretary, uh, Mrs. Neeta Prasad, who will give us a perspective of uh, the Indian government and its role uh, in uh, in the glo in the higher education system and what we are doing uh, for the global south. Uh, we just recently had these discussions, so I'm sure she can throw light. And then we will move on to other speakers. I'm glad that someone is representing a higher education institution, someone is rep representing a risk management institution where they do a lot of skilling uh, in the area of risk management. I'm sure you'll cover other areas also, Hush, and uh, a representative from the global, from Africa. Africa. So, ma'am, uh, without further ado, I move on to you. And of course, Dr. Chandrasekhar, who is like the pivot, the nucleus, dealing with the student mobility across uh, across countries to India. Thank you, Vidya ji. Is this on? Yeah. Thank you. My distinguished uh, co-panelists and uh, esteemed guests. Um, for the past three years, you would have heard a lot about the national education policy. Uh, the Indian government and we at the ministry have been uh, in the uh, process of implementing it and a lot has happened in these three years, a lot that has transformed our educational ecosystem and a lot is still uh, going on. So the concerns that this uh, policy uh, addresses, the concerns of equity, access, quality, accountability, all these are concerns that are not just ours, but uh, concerns for many, many countries. And so this is what makes this uh, document, the recommendations under this policy, very relevant for uh, many other countries other than our own. So uh, in this year, I mean, we've had uh, at least three opportunities where we've been able to showcase our policy and uh, share our learnings from its implementation with uh, other countries. First was as part of the G20 Education Working Group, and uh, the second, as Vidyaji just mentioned, uh, the Voice of the Global South Summit, of which we've had two editions so far. So in the uh, G20 working Education Working Group, we covered themes spanning across the entire education ecosystem, right from school education to higher and skilling. So we had four major themes which were uh, like which selected in such a way that they are major concerns for every country. So we had uh, uh, foundational literacy and numeracy. We, uh, we are not the only country where uh, the learning that we expect at the age of say t uh, 10 or 9 is not what it should be. There are other countries as well who are grappling with this situation. Then the use of technology to further uh, education. This is another thing which lots of us, most countries have a lot of experience because of COVID in this area, but there's a lot that needs to be done and a lot of collaboration that can happen here. Then the third was the future of work, the way that the future of work is changing and how we would like to uh, skill our youth and uh, uh, make them future ready. This is another concern. And lastly, research collaboration, especially in those uh, critical areas which are of, a con uh, of concern to every country because research is something which needs to be collaborative, needs so that you, know, you can find uh, answers, solutions to problems which affect uh, people globally. So uh, in the G20 deliberations, we were able to formulate strategies, roadmaps, and strategies for collaborative uh, um, action in the coming years. And these were also uh, included in the New Delhi leaders' declarations. Then uh, the, uh, the two summits on uh, Voice of Global South, as uh, you know, India is a champion of uh, the Global South, has always been. And uh, uh, the inclusion of the African Union uh, as a permanent member of G20 during India's presidency is, you know, vouchers for that fact. So uh, even in G20, we tried to raise concerns which are of importance 
to the Global South. In the uh, Voice of Global South Summit, we had, there were two, in both the summits, both the editions, there were two sessions which were uh, devoted to education and skilling. And uh, uh, over the two sessions, uh, nearly, I think we had uh, 29 countries participated in this. The last one was held just this month, on, on 17th of November, uh, where uh, education ministers uh, from uh, the Global South and our own education minister, they met and deliberated on several issues. So some of the most important issues that uh, came up uh, they were f that were flagged by almost all countries were issues like uh, ac access to quality education and how to make this, you know, people uh, in from v uh, vulnerable ba backgrounds, people from in remote areas, how to make quality education available to them, how to leverage technology for making this uh, education available to them, how to train and build capacity of teachers. This is such a major concern for every country, including us, because the, the way pedagogy is changing, we have to really work a lot to uh, build capacity of our teachers to cope with such change and to you know, keep pace with the content and the changing nature, nature of uh, teaching process. So this is another concern that, was, that has been flagged by countries across the global south. Research collaborations, yes, that is also because uh, uh, many countries across the spectrum have varying capabilities of research and that is another area where we need to collaborate and come together and help each other. So all these have, uh, you know, these interactions have kind of helped us to identify areas where we can collaborate. They have helped us to articulate our needs, our requirements, and, uh, you know, reach out to each other. So uh, one thing is for sure now that uh, globalization is no longer just one way mobility of students and uh, faculty. It's much more than that. There is a lot of give and take here different countries are working in different ecosystems. They, many countries have come up with innovative solutions for all these challenges which can be used uh, by us. And so there's a lot of learning involved and a lot of uh, areas where we can work together and uh, reach a common, uh, you know, uh, common uh, a target, a common achievement, common objective. So what exactly in India are we doing? What are the changes that have been uh, brought about or are being rolled out? So if I uh, limit myself to higher education, uh, we have made our uh, education more flexible, both in terms of uh, what we are teaching, what the choices are there for the students, and how they study. I mean, they don't need to do a continuous stretch of studies. If they can break at a point, there's a facility of multiple entry and exit. They can study at their convenience. They can take subjects offered across streams, even for vocational. And uh, we have this academic bank of credit in place. Uh, so everything, I mean, like uh, the, we have uh, uh, the option of taking, uh, co combining online teaching with uh, uh, in-person teaching and take the degrees accordingly. Our um, digital education or the use of technology in various aspects of education is really remarkable. It, we, uh, we have this PME Vidya initiative uh, for multimodal education, which has uh, really helped us through uh, the COVID uh, years and even now in reaching quality education to many remote areas of the country. Uh, the TV channels, which were just 36 in number, it's now going to expand to 200. Then we have uh, Swayam, Diksha, Samarth for, uh, for uh, efficient governance. We have the uh, acam academic bank of credit. So there's a lot that we can share with the world uh, in terms of uh, use of technology in education. Then we are also uh, looking, taking a relook at our vocational education. So earlier, I mean, the. Uh, there was absolutely no integration between academics and vocational education. But now with uh, the coming of the, um, now we are trying to build a seamless 
flow where a student can move from academic to vocational streams seamlessly. This, we have this um, credit uh, uh, system that we have created allows for such a movement. Uh, we are also uh, encouraging girls gender um, uh, sensitivity in education. Girls are being uh, encouraged, not just encouraged. I mean, they are doing exceptionally well, even in research, in STEM areas. So this is an entirely new ecosystem that is coming up. And uh, uh, there's uh, opening up a lot of uh, areas for collaboration. If we look at uh, the policies in internationalization, policies that are uh, aimed specifically at internationalization, then uh, UGC has come up with the uh, regulations for uh, joint, dual, and twinning degrees. So this will open up more universities, more institutions for collaboration uh, with international institutions. As it is, our research ecosystem is also improving very fast. And uh, uh, in terms of research output, we are now number four in the world. Uh, uh, we are encouraging research collaborations, uh, research ecosystems uh, through various schemes of the government. The National Research Foundation is also coming up. Uh, innovation is being uh, encouraged in a big way. Industry Connect has really taken on a new meaning now. So all these areas are uh, very uh, encouraging for the world to you know, reach out to us to, uh, or us to reach out to them with offers uh, in, uh, for uh, not just collaboration in research, but also going beyond that. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, in, uh, like to make the experience of students coming to India, uh, to make that experience more uh, uh, memorable and convenient, uh, we are also working on certain changes which had been flagged. First of all, we've come up with a portal for study in India where uh, this is a portal where any international student coming for any kind of course, short term, long term, anything, they will have to come through this portal. So, uh, and this also has an integration with the um, uh, Ministry of Home Affairs, the visa giving people. So this will uh, smoothen the visa process. Uh, Earlier students used to have a lot of problems with FRRO. All that is being streamlined through this portal. So, uh, 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 I mean, this will help the foreign students make their uh, coming to India more convenient. And uh, on campus experience also, we are looking at, we are advising institutions to have, uh, you know, um, faculty and students and groups to uh, sensitize them, take them under their uh, kind of fold and uh, make their, integrate them uh, with the uh, student community in a way that, you know, that they remember their stay in India as a great pleasurable one. I mean, apart from getting a quality education, they should, the stay should also be good. So these are some of the areas where the uh, ministry is working, the government is working, but ultimately uh, it is the institutions that uh, have to take this forward, uh, the regulators, the institutions. We are there to remove any roadblock that you encounter and flag to us. So we are all together in this, in this work in the future. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, ma'am. I mean, in a very short time, you covered almost everything. And uh, as you very rightly said that the, the new education policy, whenever we talk about it, I think uh, it came out during the whole online discourse of uh, being, uh, you know, uh, digital, uh, because it came out in 2020. And I remember that, uh, you know, we uh, probably gave more talks uh, for international audiences than Indian audiences because the international audience really wanted to know what this new education policy is all about and how it is really going to affect internationalization. So um, I'll move on to uh, our friend from Uganda uh, because she represents, uh, um, she's a woman a member of parliament uh, from northern Uganda. And I must make a mention that she was named among the 100 most influential women in the world by BBC. Uh, 100 Women 2017, winner of the Africa's Most Influential Women in Agriculture by South African-based CEO Global Group, a uh, very accomplished lady representing uh, the, uh, the government. So I would request her to give her perspective on, uh, on the issues related to Global South and how Africa is, is looking at it. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, um, my dear fellow panelists, and thank you for our audience. I really want to appreciate the submission from the government of India on the strides that you've made in the context of education. I must say that you've actually said it all, and uh, the issue of access and quality education prominently came out. But I thought in the Global South context, what we are looking at now is the relevance of education because we can have the access and the access is there to some extent. But I think uh, as, as a, a Global South, we, we are now focusing more on the relevance of the education. And uh, I've seen many countries, including my country, Uganda, there are a lot of reviews of uh, the, the curriculum so that it's aligned to the interest or the, the, the industry interest in terms of uh, uh, job placement. Now, the, the other aspect that I, I would want us to focus on is if we talk about globalization and the relationship between Global South and Global North, I always get kind of disturbed. Uh, are we collaborating? Uh, are we looking at Global South as recipients or as participants in all this discourse about, edu about our education in, uh, in the global kind of world? And in my view, I think that it's a high time we need to start talking on the table, identifying our individual or you know individual needs in the context of education. And I think you've made mention the issues of partnership and collaboration, which to me is very pertinent, and also mentorship. Uh, our education system, influenced m so much by the colonialism, was really meant to be more of administrative kind of approaches to education. But with the digitization, with the artificial intelligence, with the tech, everything that has come to this century, I think we, we need to start thinking about how to build capacities of our higher institutions and our students and our teachers to be able to deliver the education that the world actually needs. Because with the digitization now, I can be in my village but be able to read publications of a university in India. Now the challenge we have there is now, how do our people access those services? Because we are talking about in my village, I don't have electricity, I don't have water, I don't have uh, computers to do all that. So, so I, I think as we talk about uh, internalizing uh, education, we need to look at it in the context of the conducive environment that makes this education accessible to the people. Now, the, the other aspect is actually on the, the, the issue of um, what, what, what kind of education are we talking about? I think I talked about relevance. And, and the whole morning, uh, I'm one of those with a PhD, but uh, the whole discussion is around academics. And we are not bringing on the table, bridging the gap between the academics that we've known for a while to now the using that academics actually to provide the services. And for me, I look at it in the context of how do we start looking at the public, the knowledge that we've got through the mainstream or conventional education to how, how we can translate it. For example, in the Global South, our interest now is to add value to our raw materials. We've got so much raw materials, but our knowledge is so academic that it's not taking us to adding value to those raw materials so that we can sell a finished product. We grow a lot of coffee, for example, in Uganda, but we sell the beans. And when we sell the beans, whoever processes it and brings it back, as Nescafe makes 100 plus, you know, uh, 100 plus profits. So as Global South, we're beginning to ask questions around what kind of education do we actually need? Wouldn't it be just getting somebody to train and teach them how to turn the coffee beans 
to a coffee cup so that we can drink it. So, so for me, that is a context of how we've got to start looking at. And I'm glad that many countries are beginning to look uh, at, at that uh, kind of education that our people need, education that we can use to transform our countries and, and be, have employable skills and skills that can help us turn around our, our country. Um, the, the other aspect is around research funding. One of the biggest challenge why most of our, our education um, research and products are really not making themselves to the market is basically because we put very little investment into research. And yet it is that research that can actually turn around the economy. So I think uh, discussions around investing in research, not looking at research as a publication. And when we publish and then we are done, I think we need to start making, putting money in those research to get themselves into the market. And um, yes, I've seen uh, our science colleagues in the STEM kind of space are really trying to start commercializing, com commercializing the, um, their, their research and all that. And, and I think uh, one of the, the, the other aspects is how do we then uh, make sure that the, the resources or the facilities that we have in the global south, and I think you talk about it, how can we start talking among ourselves? How can we start sharing the available resources? For example, out there, India is known as the tech country. And uh, it would be very nice to hear in the higher education context and space and that ecosystem, how are you sharing that skills with the world, with the rest of the world, specifically the global south that really needs the skill, may not have the facilities and the, and, the, and the environments that would make them uh, really thrive in the context of which they're in. So basically, that's really my, my view in, in, in terms of how to globalize the education, I mean, higher education system. Uh, finally, I think one aspect is that the Global South, mainly I'm talking more about the Sub-Saharan Africa, that we have very high dropout rates of our children in the lower and, and secondary education, that we end up with very few in the higher education. So before we even talk about higher education, we need to think about policies, mechanisms that would sus sustain our children across the, the education value chain. Otherwise, we are getting, we, at the higher education level, we are getting now very few which are reaching uh, at that level. So most of those challenges that really impacts in the education value chain also needs to be uh, looked into for us to achieve our higher education uh, goal. I thank you. So thank you, uh, Agnes, for bringing in some of the very relevant points. I think two very important statements she made was, how long can Global South be a recipient? You know, uh, we should be partners in the discussions. And she also mentioned that we should be sitting down on the same table discussing. And this is very, very, uh, I mean, very important statements that you made. And you also spoke about relevance. I think it's very critical to convert those coffee beans and bring in a cup of coffee. Uh, you know, it really needs uh, uh, needs uh, a lot of skilling, um, uh, and there we have someone who's uh, uh, who's an I am Bangalore alumnus, uh, Harsha, uh, who works in a very different environment of risk management, uh, enterprise risk management, and they do a lot of skilling programs. Uh, I have requested him to speak more about about what she said. How do you bring in relevance to education, uh, and how do you mitigate risk when you bring in relevance to education? Sure. Uh, so, you know, I'll just like to throw some statistics without sounding too cynical. Uh, if you look at the global south countries, as much as we are witnessing a great entrepreneurial wave, which is a very good thing for all the economies, but still 95% startups end up failing within the first three years. That's number one. The micro, small, medium enterprises, India is 
having one of the largest number of MSMEs. And then if you look at the other global South countries, again, you have huge number of MSMEs that are contributing to the GDP. But 90% of these don't even have a succession plan. So whether the second generation, third generation, fourth generation is really going to be capable to continue those businesses. If you look at the catastrophic impact of climate change, about $4 billion is what is going to get wiped out uh, from all companies combined. And we're not serious about it. In fact, the World Economic Forum has said that climate action failure, the failure to act upon climate change is the number one risk that the world faces. The fourth thing is fake news, misinformation, deep fake videos are being circulated in our country. Uh, the Honorable Prime Minister also has kind of come out and strongly s spoken against it. 40% of the market value of companies gets wiped out when there is misinformation and fake news, right? Now, what am I hinting at? If we are talking about globalization, it's not just the campus or the faculty, like she said, and the other honorable speakers said. It's about globalizing the individual's mindset. Who is going to join these organizations, whether it is a startup, an MSME, or in a corporate role? And how can we ensure resilience, long-term sustainability, and survival of these institutions? So as education institutions, we are producing champions of change who are joining these companies in different capacities and making sure that all the risks and uncertainties and crises can be taken care of by these skilled individuals. And that's why we keep emphasizing that often if you see after the 2008-9 financial crisis, risk management was perceived as a compliance function or as a financial role. But today it's everyone's job. Risk management is just not about taking wrong decisions or right decisions. It's about knowing how to seize opportunities. It's about going to the root cause and solving a problem. I was doing a count since morning in all the sessions. There has been at least one or two speakers who've spoken about problem solving. And that's exactly what risk management is. And I think institutions can be a pioneer, especially the Indian higher education institutions. We can produce risk intelligent individuals who can take on these global challenges and we have common problems. You look at the global South countries, whether it's supply chain crisis or your cyber attacks, I mean, almost 75% individuals in all global South countries combined have faced a cyber crime in the last one year. So how are we preparing individuals to think what can go wrong before what is right? How are we preparing them to understand the root cause of a problem and solve them with the right risk mitigation strategy? And third, at a government level, at a country level, for example, the UK government today has a dedicated chief risk officer who looks after country level risks. So as India, maybe we could set up a hub for risk management and disaster management and really lead the change for Global South, whereby we are able to produce solutions, come up with research opportunities. And I think Indian higher education institutions do have that infrastructure with bodies like ours, I mean, we have been working with the United Nations, uh, the WEF, the World Bank. We've also done projects for NATO on defense risk management. So I think there's a huge opportunity which is in front of us. Our students can play a significant role in ensuring and uh, making sure that resilience sits at the center of everything that we do. So that's my two bits on, on this piece. Yeah, very good perspectives, uh, Harsh. I mean, we could, uh, I think we take risk management as more of a compliance and really, you know, being proactive about, uh, I like what you said, they think of what can go wrong than really when you think of looking at what can go right. And uh, I'm sure this is a new area that um, some of the universities, of course, are uh, skilling their uh, students in. But uh, yes, India can be a leader, again, a leader in the global south where we can take this as an opportunity to skill our young students uh, you know, in the area of risk management. I move on to a very conventional institution, the president of uh, NICMAR, Professor Anil Kashyap. I'm sure you have your own perspectives on uh, this topic. I would request you to speak. Um, I'll give my perspective um, from an academic point of view rather than academic administrator. Um, I have been 
a professor and a teacher throughout my life and has experienced uh, these debates in uh, various forums and various meetings uh, um, while I, I was working for almost 20 years in the United Kingdom. This similar debate has happened over there many times and let me flip it here as well in Indian context. From academics point of view and from the end user point of view, what is important for people to be mobile? Why somebody come um, and, and study in higher education institution in UK, US, or for that matter be in India? The first point of concern was always in those discussion was the appropriateness or relevance of education, what Agnes has also mentioned about curriculum. Curriculum had been the central point of uh, discussion that how we make the curriculum in such a way that it actually allows the global perspective and the employability into those domain, uh, those, those jurisdictions when people are mobile. So it is all about making the, um, uh, the, the student global citizen, not from the point of view of livability, but from the point of employability. That is one part. I'll and, and expand on to that as well a little bit later. But second point which I would like to say here is that in order to make that ground fertile, we need resources which are more acquainted to those locations and jurisdictions so that the value addition into teaching classroom delivery is coming from those perspectives. If I am not aware of the situation in global south outside India and not bring those case studies into those classrooms, I guess the relevance of that curriculum or that teaching and learning would would be uh, would be questionable and that is where the strengthening of curriculum and delivery in the classroom using global material global case studies not restricting them to um, uh, to only indian context uh, which mainly happens uh, i would admit in my institution for for that matter, because lots of construction case studies are taught from Indian perspective, and my professors are only acquainted to sort of Indian environment and projects, which is, which is fair enough. And the third thing is the research as well. Agnes has mentioned about research. Always <clears throat> not the research as such, the funding, but it is the promotion of multi-jurisdictional research. And let me expand on these two aspects of curriculum and research. Let me start, you know, even, uh, you know, uh, talking about research only. In European Union, um, the funding is available for multidisciplinary and multi-jurisdiction research, where more than three, minimum is three, more than three or more countries participating into that research are favored. Not that the money is spread into those locations, but it is to bring value into and globalization and dealing with something which is more beyond one jurisdiction, not only applicable to, and the benefit to the community is not to limit it to one country. That's one thing as well, and, and our policy makers um, and, uh, and John Secretary is here as well, uh, that perhaps uh, expanding our research council remit into that multidisciplinary beyond India and even into global south as well, that kind of uh, uh, treatment would really help into addressing this particular uh, thematic topic as well. Coming back to the curriculum as well, when we were talking in England, um, uh, they have started realizing that how to bring more students uh, into, um, into UK to study, and they have started using the term called decolonization of curriculum. Because most of the curriculum there was from English, uh, you know, lenses and colon colonial lenses. But I, I mean, this is, this is the need of the hour, actually. And the people who have been doing that for 400, 500 years have now started talking about decolonization of curriculum. 
here in India as well, if we want to prepare a fertile ground for people to come from global south, I think we need to actually bring a little bit more inclusiveness of global south and uh, add those uh, those bits and pieces. Even, even the coffee beans example uh, from Uganda is really fantastic to teach into our classrooms as well. Um, so that's where and, and let me finish with the third bit of that is that um, lots of ratings agencies, uh, and yesterday there was really um, good discussion about uh, benchmarking and rating uh, with the uh, chaired uh, in, in, in the evening. Um, faculty from international destinations, the um, number of faculty, I think QS rating talks about uh, 10 to 15 percent. Uh, um, 10, 10 to 15 percent, you know, faculty from uh, from international locations. I think if we are talking about global and, and really serious about globalization of higher education, let us have faculty going to global south from our place, but at the same time employing faculty from global south here as well in higher education, and that will actually bring it uh, and uh, and uh, make it more you know level playing field as well as you know even a welcoming thing uh, um, uh, for for those students as well, and the mentors from those locations actually will be more better advocate than somebody from India looking after the international students. I'll I'll finish here with my three points and come back later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kashyap. I think you brought in very important points uh, as an academic uh, who's worked in India and who's also worked abroad. Uh, the first one on multi-jurisdictional research. I think when we always look at multi-jurisdictional research, again, we skew towards the north. You know, Even as a university, I can say that many of our joint research pro uh, projects that we undertake, maybe because of the EU funding, are skewed to the European uh, countries or, or UK or US. How many of us have really reached out to our African counterparts for a multi-jurisdictional research? I'm sure there would be several opportunities that we actually reach out to even as far as South America. So that's something that was of really relevance. And uh, you also spoke about decolonization of curriculum. I think uh, we're all talking about it in India as well, as much as they should do in Africa. Uh, and maybe other countries of the of the global south. And uh, again, something very important that you said was to uh, bring in case studies from the global south into our classrooms. How many of us do that? We don't even get Indian case studies in our in our classrooms. And can African business schools get some Indian uh, you know case studies in their classrooms? And we get you know some of their very successful case studies in our classrooms. Again, skewed to the north. We always talk about case studies that Harvard has published, and you know or you know some european business school has uh, you know discussed and then uh, faculty exchange very relevant point uh, you brought in sir because again we are skewed towards the north uh, we always look at faculty from the us from uk um, you know from our european partner uh, institutions honestly even if i look at the 80 mous that are signed at my university I'm sure there are hardly any with any of the African universities or any of the Latin American universities. I think as a country from the global south, we should be the first ones to reach out to them, to discuss with them, whether it's curriculum, whether it's joint research, uh, whether it is attracting students or discussing case studies and of course for faculty exchange. So when we talk about attracting students and who are the, going to be the beneficiaries of all that we speak, I cannot but invite Dr. Chandrasekhar who deals with uh, the largest student base through the Study in India program that is uh, a wonderful initiative launched by EDSIL, which he heads uh, since 2018. Uh, so maybe you could discuss your perspective. Thanks a lot, uh, Vidya, co-panelist here. So it's interesting, I'm not going to talk about Study in India, but the concepts which has been come into Study in India, what is in the internationalization in terms of curriculum relevance, how policy perspectives countries can work around i think some several of the examples have been talked has been spoken about and mentioned about so what is needed is india is not new to internationalization we know that uh, the nalanda takshashila vikramshila was established in 5th and 6th century there were scholars who came to these universities spent more than 10 years to study about Sanskrit, grammar, mathematics, Vedic science, medicine, and so on. So India is a hub of learning on the Gurukula system, or traditional system, modern, modern system. All these universities have been incubating these ideas, 
and we have been progressing continuously with decades and decades new modern concepts so we have been already into that process learning process teaching process at the same time there were also indian schools indian pathshalas established outside which had promoted buddhism indian knowledge system and so on so india is not new to that we have been already advocating that the what has changed is over the years the systems the policies the strategies and the kind of engagement we look at how student mobility can happen or faculty exchange can happen or the knowledge exchange can happen this has varied i think we need to learn from this past bring into a culminate into a policy which can really look at south south collaborations india south collab global south collaborations and so on we need to build on a mechanism and not only i think we had been so far focusing on the formal education system either to a graduation or a doctoral program or a post graduate program we have not looked at beyond what is needed for bringing uh, for Uh, bringing a good citizen to the country or bringing good citizen to the society i think these are the kind of characteristic attributes we need to bring into the curriculum the kind of exchange model we are looking at which will really build value for the uh, global uh, citizens that is one part when you look at the curriculum i think most often we have been confined to our own economic development addressing its own needs and objectives but i think recently we have come into the kind of bringing a global curriculum where important case studies either in in engineering or in management or in political science we have been able to bring these case studies and india is one which had taken lead uh, we have gone out to establish campuses and uh, things i am sure there will a lot of learning aspects which will come into that but most important is is to build a dialogue and coming on to a table to identify these opportunities bring, bring into the uh, a curriculum to uh, make a uh, global programs that is a uh, key things the another major aspect what we see an opportunity is to build a kind of an higher education network of institutions where indian institutions can speak to the developing countries and when we speak it's not the broad objectives but you look at program objectives the need local needs local skill requirement and geographic relevance so the, it means that the curriculum needs to be a broad base which a global curriculum so that institutions can build uh, international uh, curriculum which is relevant to the specific program objectives these are some of the things i thought it can be of uh, more relevance in terms of assistance another policy aspects which i think uh, we need to get engaged with the higher education institutions across is on the how uh, brics is another example they made it a policy where mobility of students can happen across and it is a must which brings in lot of value addition in terms of building attributes of the citizens of the learners engagement in particular aspects so there are several things one can look at but these are the key pockets of excellence we needs to build across not only policy perspective looking at the curriculum how students learners can move across to learn what he aspires how he can become a skillful relevant to the country and society thanks a lot thank you sir for uh, bringing out these uh, various perspectives i think uh, what comes out in common is uh, you know that uh, we in india can look at uh, the global south as as a big brother uh, that's what you all consider india as and look at various aspects and bring in the global south uh, closer to india uh, we have a lot of time at least another 20 minutes uh, I, we can go on and on but uh, i since morning i've really not given a chance to the audience to participate in the discussion so Uh, we can uh, you know uh, request some of the members to either ask questions or you know provide with some relevant suggestions uh, on this very topic please let's not divert into the new education policy and uh, you know we would really like to take in some takeaways from uh, from this very important topic because we have august members on the panel from the ministry of education as well please identify yourself if you can introduce yourself and then uh, comment hello 
Hello, ma'am. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Anirudh. I'm a professor at uh, OP Jindal Global University. And my question to the panel is, uh, in India, we have quite a lot of racist issues when people from the African nations come to India. Uh, that's one issue. And how are we dealing with those racial issues? Because that affects our image when we go out. Because I have been lucky to be out and never faced any racial issues. Neither my kids faced any racial issues. Second question is the employment. So if an African student come to India, they ought to be getting a job. And our, um, our institutional structures are such that it's very hard for a foreigner to get a, get a job in India and have a sustainable life and look at a future resident of India for a long term. And those two issues are kind of limiting our image in the ex outside India and also limiting our educational market. Can I, can I respond? Because it's very, very close to my heart. Maybe then I can pass it on to you all. Because I can't resist responding to your, you know, to your question. Because this is a question which is so very relevant. You know? And it was constantly in my mind to bring up these issues. But I said, maybe this, it's, it won't be nice for me to bring this up. But what you said is, said is very, very right. You know, culturally, are we ready to accept the Global South is a question that we need to ask. And one of the major players in Global South, of course, is Africa. And, uh, you know, Symbiosis has done this for the last 52 years. In fact, it was born out of, uh, you know, of compassion to an African student. Exactly because of this, because they felt discriminated. If uh, an African student would say that if a, if, a, if a seat next to me is empty in a bus, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, another person would not want to sit next to me because I'm black. If I get up in the morning and go to the toilet, my Indian uh, friends would close their windows because they don't want to see a black face. This is the kind of discrimination that African students had and probably still have. Are we really you know, willing to have an atmosphere, an ecosystem, to accept these differences in culture? Or are we still going to go by the belief that it's white, is a, which looks nice, is the only thing that we're going to accept? So I think a change in mindset of young people, at least, who are working who are studying in our institutions, we need to sensitize them. And I think diversity is exactly, and that's where student mobility helps. Our students going out, their students coming in, and having a, you know, a diverse culture on our university campuses is going to help you know, uh, at least a later generation that will not discriminate. This is the, my first response. The second response is something that I have taken up on several occasions and say this with uh, her presence here. I've said this so many times that we need to introduce some kind of work visa after their uh, studies are over, at least for six months or one year. It's not about Global South students. I'm talking about international students. Why do Indian students go to America and other countries? Do they study at the, 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 the so-called Ivy League universities? I'm sure they study in some of the universities who may not be as good as Indian universities. But because they find opportunities to work there. I mean, even students who come to study in India are obviously come here for affordable education, for quality education, but also because they've heard a Satya Nadella and a Sundar Pichai leading organization. So they want to know what the Indian industry is all about. And uh, But the argument, I, whenever I've had it on so many meetings, the argument is that when Indian students don't get jobs, do we offer jobs to our you know, international students? It's not that if you have to increase the international student base from 49,000 to 2 lakh or someone in the morning, I think BVR Subramaniam said 5 lakhs international students, unless you open up for jobs, they're not going. And I'm not saying jobs for perpetuity. We're not talking about permanent residency like Australia does. But certainly, at least a six months to one year post-study work visa. Uh, otherwise, they have to just go home uh, the moment they get, you know, the moment they finish their exams, not even wait for the convocation. So, uh, anyway, this is. No, no, no please. Thank, thank you. And and I mean, this thing resonates uh, so well <coughs> with with myself as well. And um, it's not a national issue or a particularly with India or abroad, it is a global issue um, of uh, sort of how, um, you know, people treat each other. And it is something which we need to imbibe as a society, actually. It is nothing nothing to do with higher education as such. It is uh, it is a general societal sort of a uh, agenda which, uh, which, which need to be taken. Um, and I can give you an example um, for, of my experience staying in Northern Ireland. Um, on, on a river, there were two bridges. Um, one bridge was used by Catholic uh, uh, residents, another was used, used by Protestant. 
know nobody would use the the from other community use the the bridge meant for the other community so you know such kind of divide does exist everywhere um in in the world but it is been how it been tackled and how it is been been sounded out in terms of no tolerance policy actually um, um and and that kind of and even non discrimination if you are on a table in any english institution um, as a professor you will be just as fairly as uh, as you would be any of the local resident over there and i have got leadership role in uk you know having having those kind of confidence in that so as a society we need to be uh, doing much more um, you know even before or even simultaneously when we talking about globalization of education um, some sort of parallel discourse should go um, and continue and be strengthened by the leadership uh, at the top level i guess that will be that will be most impactful thank you believe me both the issues resonate uh, a lot with the government also the first one uh, about discrimination it is something uh, when i was talking about you know uh, sensitizing institutions to welcome students and uh, you know handhold them set them up in uh, in their uh, institution help them to adjust this is what i meant so the mindset change is also happening in other ways like like we've opened up uh, india for um, foreign institutions to come and set up uh, institutions here or we've allowed joint dual degrees uh, or we are also setting up institutions abroad like uh, iits have gone to tanzania and to abu dhabi so all this will allow a lot more mobility a lot more intermingling of students and that will uh, change perceptions change attitudes and i have a lot of faith already in the younger generation they are much more much more globalized mentally than uh, even say people 10 years back much more so uh, on that front i am really really hopeful that things are changing and as for the other part about uh, um, you know getting jobs we understand it's a it's a need of the art and with more and more institutions more and more global students coming in uh there will be more push more demand for it it does it's an issue which as uh, um, vidya ji just said ki yeah it's a it's an issue of uh, jobs being in scarcity so where do you provide how do you provide but obviously we also understand that there is a big demand and it is a necessity so let's see what change how things unfold can i add a couple yeah. of observations i think she, she wants to say something do you want to Uh, yeah just want to uh, comment uh, briefly on on the issue of racism and employment I'm, i'm really surprised because africa looks at india as a friend and my country 60% of my economy is run by indians the richest man in my country is an indian so i, I think you need to learn from that that in africa we've accepted that these are our brothers who are just on the other side and so this got to do with creating an enabling environment that our global south people come here and feel comfortable and i think as governments also we need we've got to start looking at those enabling policies that uh, enables the employment the interaction the mobility of education and all that kind of stuff but i i really want to thank you that uh, we are already thinking about this so that our discussions in such meetings do not only stop here but we go back and actually uh, actualize it so for me i think it's it's a very yeah it looks sensitive but i think in terms of uh, awareness as you rightly said it the strategy and positioning i don't know whether you you know when you're in your country you don't know <laughs> but india at the moment is one of those which is uh, having the is medical tourism governments across the world i mean i came for medical as well in june and in the hospital where i was it was like uh, an international airport 
and with all the flags all over the world in the in the in the hospital because everybody's there and so i was looking at when i was called for this um, session i'm looking at okay i think we can make our education be as international as medical tourism as well so i think as my colleague has said it's it's doable it is us. Uh, fortunately, we are leaders of institutions. We are leaders in government. We can use that opportunity to create that enabling environment. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, yes. Okay, ma'am, can I? <coughs> My name is Pankaj, and I'm also working with OP Jindal Global University. Earlier, I was fortunate to work in Symbiosis as well. Um, <coughs> I would like to just say that. One is the right product, second is the right marketing, and number three, when they come here, what kind of experience they go, so that they are going back as our advocates. So that is what I'd like to say. And there are uh, certain things which we can say, okay, the West is also doing, the me too kind of products are there. Rather than that, we should see what we, what is our core. I'm also part of the government's resource group on uh, Indian knowledge system. So I know there are so many things like you know the yoga nidra, meditation, mindfulness. Uh, I also teach courses on Bhagavad Gita in many countries, and also the courses on uh, ancient wisdom. So sometimes the courses which are being offered by the universities in India, I'm just taking a general comment, which are sometimes not catering to their needs. Like you know our students go sometime to UK and then they come back, they they are not able to find a job here in India. So we need to look into the whole perspective that what will make a difference, maybe certain core courses and certain specialized courses, somebody who's coming from Africa, what will make a difference there? So if we can do that, uh, we can, uh, you know, we'll be able to add more value. And uh, of course, I know Symbiosis does a great deal. People are feeling quite at home and very, very family environment is there. I believe many other universities might also be thinking that way. So such kind of love and affection, people will never forget. So I believe that the product offering has to be very much revised. That what we are doing, we, you know, we are what we believe we are. So sometimes if you want to do a copy, okay, what Harvard is doing, we should also do that. No, we have so many greater things to offer to the world. So that is what I just wanted to make a small suggestion. Yeah, this is exactly what came out in yesterday's discussion when we were talking about benchmarking. And in the morning also, I think someone said that we need to re, uh, lo also look at what is the global requirement of a global workforce and can we really create programs and can we tweak our curriculum to their requirement. For example, nursing. I mean, there's a huge, huge demand of okay. Indian nurses outside and they're so well respected. Uh, but on the other side, Indian Nursing Council does not allow you more than 50 students or 60 students as an intake. Now, this has to change and I think that push has to come from some of us. Anybody else? Would oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Yeah, actually, my name is uh, Professor Bhavyas Kumar. I had served in various roles uh, as Dean and uh, Pro VC or uh, Founding VC both positions in various uh, universities. Uh, I would like to supplement to the observations that are ma made by Professor in the front row from Jindal. Uh, Professor Anil Kashyap from UK, he has mentioned what his observations had been. And I happen to have very extended uh, observations and experience in USA for 13 years or so. And I have worked in international uh, 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 MNCs there for them, projects for them, or national labs in USA or uh, state universities, which are highly ranked research universities. And I, fo I found there uh, the, uh, the environment is very much saturated with uh, what he says it does not exist outside. Actually, it is. It is very much saturated to the level that you are in disbelief going from uh, national institutions from India to abroad to learn more and see the kind of uh, uh, discrimination that uh, exists prevails there even to access the facilities like other uh, students or other faculties. I've seen NRA professors really suffering uh, 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 in various universities, not just one. So that is one. So that is uh, that observation maybe, I don't know, maybe has been extremely lucky to go to a country where that uh, part has been taken care of by the system, but it is not so everywhere. Even USA is very much struggling and now it is actually regressing uh, under Trump era, uh, our effects of that. So now, going back to the, uh, after coming back to India, I happened to uh, work with various universities. One of them happened to be more than a dozen years ago, somewhere in Great Noida. Uh, and I was a chief proctor. 
and the direct HR comes to me. Uh, the faculty and the students, we, we used to have a very large number of African students. Uh, they had opened up a separate hostel for them and uh, uh, they, they were being mistreated. So the direct HR comes to me. He says, Professor Kumar, <laughs> you help me with this. I said, don't worry, I will uh, prepare a diversity framework. So you need to sensitize. Madam, actually, you, you have talked about sensitization. You, you have used the word already, so sensitization, gender sensitization, or diversity sensitization. So that is a framework I developed, a very brief framework within two pages, how the not only the students, the staff, I'm talking about the staff that they have to deal with, whether in the account section, in the admission section, in the office section, or in the dean section, in the office. So they have to, because oftentimes, they are not very well-trained, very well-educated uh, staff that is sitting in the interface with the students on a daily basis. Okay. So they have to be also sensitized. And beyond that, the faculty, so that there is no discrimination in terms of assessments. So these are the, some of the points that I had highlighted in the framework so that they feel at, uh, uh, they are more comfortable here and more welcome. Okay, yeah. thank you. Anybody else with something different from what we've already discussed? I'm Dr. Manohar, chairing a consortium of educators uh, from, from Bangalore. Um, Ma'am, we have a successful model when it came to trade, for instance. We have Focus America, Focus Latin America, Focus ASEAN. Likewise, in education, can we look at study in India as one concept? Focus Africa, Focus ASEAN, wherever we feel that we have a better place to work. It may not be Focus North America, but at least we have Focus South America. Likewise, if we come out with a different policy uh, narratives, uh, which is suitable to that, you know, market and is not only there coming here, we also should be going there for sharing the knowledge. I think that is on the government side, if there is a strategic initiative along with organizations like FIKI, I think would be a good idea to begin with. So you would like to respond? As we say, study in India is, is a flagship program of the ministry and it's still being the executing agency. We have these focus themes and Africa is one of the uh, Global South focus countries. Wherever the need comes, along with the Indian missions abroad, we do education phase outreach programs. And now we have a little bit fine-tuned our focus while I have been telling about the policy context, program-specific, institute-specific partnerships. We look at that opportunity still more. I think we are reaching out. And uh, in, in uh, recently, just to add, Vietnam, we had signed at least some 10 MOUs with institution to institutions where they look at some kind of a joint programs at undergraduate, postgraduate, and doctoral level. Uh, so there is a focus, there is an idea, there is a vision uh, to reach out to these. While, while I say the, we, have, we are going away from the formal education, these are the kind of opportunities we are looking at. We are very keen. We have. Uh, drafted a policy and it is on the approval stage which we, which we will take it up and more specific I would like to add I think the, we have to learn from the recent developing countries uh, Malaysia Singapore who have invested huge on research and almost 70 percent of the research pursued in these countries Singapore Malaysia Philippines Thailand to some extent are Indian Indian students so uh, they have looked at a kind of an alternate long-term engagement of student learners. I think mobility and uh, access to this kind of resources on research will give more relevance to the kind of societal outcomes. I think that's where the institutions need to focus and of course Indian institutions are focusing on that. But I think that has not come out. I think study in India has now come to that kind of uh, global positioning where any students coming in has to come through study in India, whether it is research program, whether it's short program, or whether it is some kind of a, uh, uh, in service and pre-service training program. This study in India will become one portal. It's a portal where uh, students need to register, look at a seamless kind of uh, passage from student registration to visa process to FRRO and, and alumni registration. So that's the kind of global outlook, out, uh, wider outlook we had uh, proposed and we have incorporated. It, it is on the public uh, thing and we can still look at some kind of, we have been talking about how focused approaches needs to be made in terms of outreach. We are doing that and we will continue to do that. Thank you, sir. One last comment. I think you were raising your hand and then we'll close.
Thank you so much. Um, my question is on the National Research Foundation. Very keen to hear more about more about this, but also in terms of um, internationalization that has come up, voice of the global south, where mm -hmm. India is posi positioning itself as that. Um, what role does the NRF play and also internationalization in NRF, please? Uh, NRF is actually uh, uh, not being handled by the education ministry. It is the, the nodal ministry in this case is the um, principal scientific advisor's office and they are working on it. Meanwhile, uh, in education from the uh, education ministry itself, we have uh, entered into several, um, I mean, like uh, one big change that we've brought in is to kind of focus our, um, all our research uh, uh, initiatives on certain areas which we, um, uh, which, which have emerged from the G20 deliberations. So uh, like uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, areas like artificial intelligence, uh, sustainable technologies, mining, um, rare earths, these are some of the areas which um, critical and emerging technologies. Uh, so these are some of the areas where we are planning to focus our research instead of having, uh, having it spread across thinly to all areas, we are saying for better impact, let's focus it to some areas. And uh, um, we are also uh, revamping all our existing uh, research schemes to focus on these areas. So um, we, have, we have a very thriving uh, research ecosystem. Uh, I mean, when it comes to international collaborations, uh, we have with, uh, yes, it is with largely the global north so far. Yeah, uh, but we uh, and it is also uh, with the bigger institutions like IITs and all, and there are some private institutions who are also very active. But uh, uh, we are trying to handhold the uh, other institutions like NITs, the state universities. Also, this is also in our plan. So, like uh, with uh, we have uh, set up a committee called the it's the it's an empowered committee of uh, our top institutions, some eight to 10 institutions. And this is a committee uh, which will kind of guide research in the country, I mean, research that is coming through the educational ecosystem. Uh, it's not necessary that they themselves will be uh, part of the research projects. They may be, but their job is also to see that uh, the research is uh, aligned to our national priorities. Global South is a priority there that uh, we have it with countries. I mean, uh, we have a diversity uh, in that uh, respect. Then uh, uh, the institutions uh, in the country, the in institutions like the uh, state universities, like private institutions, like NITs, which are uh, not in the international uh, radar for uh, collaboration, research collaboration yet, not in a big way at least. So they are kind of uh, mentored in this. So this is the plan that is unfolding at the moment. So thank you. Because I think she has a flight to catch, okay. she has to right. rush. So uh, thank you very much, uh, all my panelists here, and of course, uh, the wonderful audience. Uh, it's nice to have an audience which is really interested in the topic so that you are uh, not on your phones but really listening, responding and also participating in the discussions. I think it's so true that uh, you know we've discussed a topic that is close to my heart, internationalization of higher education and someone that uh, a topic that ma'am works on and all of us being interested. And now to focus on Global South. Uh, I think uh, India is at that cusp where you know this whole uh, year has been really a year of internationalization I would say with the G20 that we are hosting, the, the presidency of G20 that we got and the kind of discussions that took place in the city of Pune uh, where uh, you know all education ministers met and then the two uh, sessions on the voice of Global South again uh, depicting that India is a big brother, a big player, a driver and a leader of the Global South. So I think these discussions will certainly find uh, its significance uh, and I'm sure ma'am you will take some good thoughts and memories from this session to be incorporated in some of the policies that you will come up with. So thank you once again for a patient listening. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, may I request all our panelists to kindly come together for a group photograph. And ladies and gentlemen, with that we close the proceedings of the conference of day one. Tomorrow again we begin at 9 a.m. 
with the B2B meetings. And at 10.30, we have a very important session where the Honorable Secretary, Higher Education, Government of India, will be addressing the August House in the Beam Auditorium. We would request you all to be here in time. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have networking over tea and coffee, followed by the award presentation ceremony from 7 p.m. onwards, and which will be conclude, uh, will be concluding the evening with dinner. So ladies and gentlemen, do stay back with us. Join us at 7 p.m. in the Beam Hall for the award presentation ceremony and kindly...